Our last team that's going to be presenting um, today uh, made us all extremely proud, of course, as all the teams do, but uh, they in particular won the Best Presentation Award at the International Public Relations Research Conference. This is a team made up of Navy and Marine um, cohort students, and um, they won the Big Jack, uh, which is an award that really SDSU wins all the time because we're pretty amazing, as you can see. Um, but you'll see how great they are. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, Courtney Callahan, Nick Manweiler, and Josh Pena for talking about when uh, sailors behave badly. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone tuning in around the world. I'm Lieutenant Courtney Callahan. And I'm Captain Josh Pena. And I'm Major Nick Manweiler. It's four o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Your unit has been home from deployment for a month and the homecoming misconduct is starting to pop up. In addition to three drunken disorderlies, four Navy sailors and Marines have gotten DUIs. Your work cell phone begins to ring. You reach over and answer it. And the command duty officer informs you that last night a sailor was arrested following a car crash. Two people were injured and the sailor blew a .10. Just as you're getting off the phone with the command duty officer, the commanding officer's phone number pops up on your screen. A morning huddle is called for later in the morning between the boss, the command master chief, you and the SJA. As you walk into his office, the local newspaper sits on the table. The headline reports the crash and the arrest. To say that the commanding officer is displeased is an understatement. America doesn't, well, he goes around the room and is getting feedback from all the different staff. When he gets to you, he is absolutely convinced that the command's pattern of misconduct means loss of public trust, uh, reputational damage for the service, and an angry chain of command. We know that when publics and stakeholders are exposed to uh, repeated media stories talking about a, an issue, it forms an association in their minds between that issue and the organization. America doesn't need a Marine Corps, it wants a Marine Corps. The Navy is America's Navy. These institutional rally points uh, pressure us as officers to recoil when we see media coverage highlighting the latest service member misconduct or violations of our ethos, something that seems to be on the uptick in the last few years. Our research suggests that the, the peril may not be as great as we think. Why Gelton Kammerer 1998 defined organizational reputation as a set of socially constructed attributes associated with an organization informed by past actions. Bomber 1999 expanded the definition to include future prospective actions and the comparison to leading rivals. While stakeholders obtain most of their information about an organization through the news media, it's reporters and journalists who produce and report a personal assessment of an organization's reputation. For practitioners, this underscores the importance of cultivating relationships with the media prior to a crisis. For our research, we wanted to evaluate to what degree employee misconduct outside of the office or in a personal capacity impacts organizational reputation. We used Hallahan's 1999 definition of attribute frame to develop realistic frames which could be manipulated in a news story we, sorry, we employed a two by two by two factorial design with pre-test and post-test. Each treatment depicts either a U.S. Navy or U.S. Marine Corps service member arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence, resulting in a crash which injures two people. We then manipulated two additional variables. The first is a derogatory frame depicting the organization as having a history of misconduct and the other is a flattering frame depicting the individual as having saved a family during Hurricane Dorian relief efforts. The DOI storyline represents a realistic scenario typically faced by PAOs assigned to a unit level command. We used Coombs and Holiday's organizational reputation and Valentin and Fleischmann's professional ethics standard scales. 411 SDSU students participated in our study ranging in age from 18 to 47 with an average age of 21. Females represented 79% and 21% were males. So we identified two research gaps that the present study can contribute to. <clears throat> First, does um, 
what is the effect on uh, employee misconduct when done outside of working hours on an organization's reputation? We did find research that exists on misconduct that happens during working hours, such as police shootings, or when employees are viewing pornography on a work computer. However, the, um, those types of research did not address our key question. Secondly, we became pretty excited about the notion of third party moral licensing. See, this occurs when you think less of a bad deed that I've committed when you become aware of a previous good deed that I have also committed. We found research on self-moral licensing primarily in the psychology field. However, third party moral licensing had yet to be observed experimentally through the media. So third party moral licensing, it can occur under one of two models. First, the moral credit model. Second, the moral credential model. Now moral credit is like having a moral bank account. So you do more good deeds, you get to add credit and value to the account. Now, when you do bad deeds, that represents a reduction in the account or a debt. So individuals can actually do bad things and, and acquire a third party moral license. However, that deed needs to be equal to or less than the credit that they have available in that moral bank. Now, if the deed is too great, they can find themselves in a moral deficit. And in that case, third party moral licensing is not likely to occur. Right. In our study, we focused on the credential model, and that, that aligns with what we mentioned earlier, which is when an observer interprets a bad deed as less bad when they become aware of previous uh, good deeds. So what we were able to do was to determine if this was occurring by giving participants a treatment that had a flattering frame and comparing that with participants who received a separate treatment without the flattering frame. So what did we find? Uh, we started off by exploring the differences, determining whether there is a difference between the Navy and the Marine Corps, given service chief signaling for tighter inter integration and interoperability in our future. Uh, independent samples key tests across all of our scales found no difference between the services. Second, uh, if you'll recall, we were trying to determine whether misconduct beyond the office walls impacts organizational reputation. A series of one-way ANOVAs paired samples key test and independent, independent samples key test determine that there is no impact on organizational reputation. In fact, organizational reputation for both services slightly increased uh, even when we showed them a negative news story about misconduct. So that was, that was impressive to us. Uh, and then finally, while we did see uh, the increase in organizational reputation, um, we did note that uh, perceived ethical, perceived professional ethical standards did take a significant hit. Uh, we used a, to measure this, we used a five item scale that asked statements such as, the organ members of the organization conduct themselves in an ethical manner and the organization encourages uh, further ethical development and training. Now, what we discovered was that the treatment carried, or the results carried across all of our treatments. So what we were seeing was consistently, our participants viewed our ethical standards more negatively, uh, unfortunately, even when we gave them a positive past deed by the service member. In the absence of a moral licensing scale, we asked participants to indicate to what degree they felt the service member was a good person and how severe of a punishment they should receive from the military. We, an independent samples t-test found that participants who received a flattering good deed frame felt the service member was a better person and should receive less severe of a punishment than those who did not receive the frame. This is, became our most significant finding as this study is the first to experimentally prove that the news media can influence a third party moral licensing effect. A one-way ANOVA also found the same findings for the treatment which contained the derogatory history of organizational misconduct with the flattering good deed frame, indicating that participants are viewing the service member solely on his own actions and do not factor in previous employee misconduct in passing judgment. The severe punishment question is the only place where we found demographics played a significant role in how participants responded. We found that those with a connection to the military, either through personal service or close family and friends, felt that the service members should receive a more severe punishment than those with no connection to the military. And while just outside of significance at P equals 0.062, we found that females also felt that the service members should receive 
a more harsh punishment compared to the males, regardless of treatment type. So what can public relations practitioners take away from the study? Well, first, if members of a service-oriented organization are in the media for misconduct, it is likely that that misconduct will not affect the organization's reputation. For those individuals, if the organization does possess a history of misconduct, that is not going to affect how the public views them individually. And in fact, they could be seen in a, in a more positive view if the media introduces a good previ previous good deeds that have been done by that same individual. And for PR practitioners who represent individuals, they can leverage this third party uh, moral licensing effect uh, through the media. However, as stated, the or an organization at large may not benefit from this. So in conclusion, we want to iterate, why did we even come up with a study? We wanted to find something that's relevant and that can benefit fellow public relations officers out there in the military um, to help them become better uh, advisors for their commanders. Uh, so now we have research and quantitative data that could be used to support uh, consultation and that can back up the experience of our more senior PAOs who are probably shaking their heads as we're talking through this entire study because they've been there and had similar situations. This concludes our presentation. What questions do you have? All right.